Our Heavenly Father, we have before us in our text in Luke our Lord's strong admonition to the people of his generation. The strength of that admonition is for their own well-being. For their own walk. As he forewarns, as he pleads with a generation to see and understand. Our Lord and our God, we like manner take such warnings we bow before thy throne and pray that we would be pleasing to thee we would walk O lord with thee one with another be faithful to thee and with each other to bear the crust of what it is to be called a christian in this world even in the church Division is rife, no man considers their end in such things. The Lord and our God, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, commune one with another. And most especially as we, Father, commend, or rather commune with thee, thy Son. Help us, Father, especially in this day of our fathers, a day where <clears throat> the rule of the head of the household is set before all of us to represent the Father, to represent the glory of what it is, to assume the mantle of proper authority over those who look to us and trust. For it is holy. And now we ask you, Father, for this mercy. Pray, Lord, that I beseech thee that you would hear our prayers and our petitions this day in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> We're told that if you see lightning, count the number of seconds between that and its following thunder. For every five seconds, we're told there'd be a mile. In other words, the lightning is off that far. For every five seconds, distance or time, it's a mile in distance from the lightning, the storm. We see that. We study the weather. In fact, we get a little anxious when our weathermen are inaccurate. We expect them to be and depend upon them to be accurate concerning our plans especially for the next day we all know what it is to see storm clouds on the horizon they come up suddenly if you're hiking up in the mountains you have to get off the summit or off the ridge to go to a place of safety from winds and flooding or snow blizzards you have to be able to predict and sometimes it's unpredictable. You can see the signs, but by the time you recognize the signs, they're upon you. In some cases with the weather, but usually the clouds will give away what's happening. The rise of those large cumulonimbus crop, uh, clouds, those heavy, thick clouds that darken the horizon and move toward us. We can see and we can predict the weather. We are trying to be more accurate with that weather. Hence the counting between lightning and its consequent thunder. And the miles away that it might be. All those things and of course many more we speak of. But they did too in the days of Christ. They knew the signs of the weather, of the heat storm that would come. And he speaks of that. Of weather that rolls in that's dangerous. And we prepare ourselves. But Christ wasn't speaking of weather. You see, there was a time in Israel's history where David and Israel simply missed the Lord's 
the Lord's warnings. We're not given much about it. We have to derive it from a comparison of a number of texts. But we know that in the days of David, as David was attempting to keep Israel unified, you've heard me speak of that. His calling as the king and as a prophet was to reestablish Israel as a covenant people, to keep her unified. She had on her west the Philistines, a small territory but a very powerful enemy. She had to her south, somewhat to her east, south and into her southwest, Edom. Above that, Moab, to her east and somewhat to the south as well. Above that, Ammon, the Ammonites. So she had four powerful enemies that determined a ring about her. But above that were the Syrians. And in fact, if you look at Psalm 60, if you turn please to Psalm 60, you're going to see the details of one of the most trying, most distressing times in all of Israel's history. It was a question whether or not Israel would survive. In Psalm 60, we're told the chief musician upon Shushanadoth, that means chief musician with trumpets, that when they sang the psalm, they would, there would be a blare of trumpets. The chief musician would call Israel to memory with a certain blast of the trumpets to remember this day, this series, actually this series, this episode. A miktam of David. A miktam often has a surprise ending. It's a golden psalm. In other words, you're expecting one thing and the Lord does something else. What was expected was defeat. It was expected by the enemies of Israel that they could wipe out Israel. In fact, they expected to make this a post-Israel generation. That's what they were expecting. And they undertook their task with amazing secrecy. We'll see that in a moment. Israel missed all the signs of the storm brewing. But first, take a look. It's a midtime of David to teach. It was something that had to be taught to Israel. Kind of like what happens at Thanksgiving or July 4th coming up on us quickly. Where we should be teaching a heritage to our, to our young ones, to our families. There's a time to teach about the memory of what happened on the, those days or in that episode of history. July 4th ought to commemorate a period where the church should know every bit as much about the great deliverances of that time, as well as, as they would of, say, the persons and the, and the legal steps that were taken, the Constitution Bill of Rights that followed in the decade afterwards, the freedoms that were secured. But what about the great deliverances of that era? If you know those, what our forefathers did. Um, to teach when he strove with Aram Naharayim, that was the Syrians, and they came from as far back as the Euphrates River. They were behind other enemies, and that would be the, and with the Aram Zuba, Aram is Syria. That would be the Syrians of, say, Damascus and Hamath. So up into, up into the north and east, you had a powerful coalition, and they were backed up by yet another coalition of Aramans. So Israel was encircled. What they didn't realize is that all of those groups had finally determined that they had had it with Israel's existence. It's pretty clear, we'll beg the work of Satan here in this particular, and assuming it to be the case, that he, so, that he was attempting to unite such coalitions as would wipe out Israel's existence. You know, we're declared to be in the post-Christian era. And there are Christians even that nod the head and say, yeah, we are. Well, you don't realize what that means. The post-Christian era is a declaration of war against the existence of what's left of the church. The Humanist, the humanist Manifesto the, makes its declaration. It's decrying our very existence. Well, that's what was happening here. Now, you have the Philistines on the east, the Edomites that circle to the south, and to the east and west, and then circle the bottom to the south. So, Moab, Ammon, 
And then to the extreme north and east, you have backed up one against uh, uh, with each other. You have the Aramaeans, the Syrians. And they were working in secret with each other. Like I said, the people were lethargic. There was in the kingdom of Israel division. People, there's a lethargy. There was opposition within Israel to David's headship and authority. There was opposition to Samuel, who now has long since passed, but it was against his warnings. And certainly, in fact, they, be, they were becoming increasingly a heathen nation. There was schism. There was treason. Ephraim and Manasseh were breaking away from David's hold. They didn't care about separating the kingdom. There's intertribal jealousy. Judah was the lawgiver. The tribe of Judah had been well taught by Samuel and by David. And that law of the Lord was being restrained. It was being checked by the other tribes. The leader of the coalition, now remember, the people of God were lethargic. There was actually a time of peace. David had settled and the people were beginning to prosper. They had been settled, but not in the Lord. And the Lord's displeasure grew. You see that in Psalm 60, O God, verse 1, Thou hast cast us off. Thou hast scattered us. Thou hast been displeased. Thou turn thyself to us again. Something is about to happen in the narrative. The people of God were lethargic, they were self-confident, they were complacent, there were many of them that were treacherous, they were divisive, faithfulness, as the psalmist says, almost didn't exist in part, parts of Israel. There were sons of Belial, those individuals that are very different, that are very dangerous. To handle them is like handling a, a thorn bush. You will get, you will get uh, torn up. And they were scattered throughout Israel. There was envy of David's leadership. The coalition was headed up by Hadadezer ben Rehob. You don't maybe know his name. He made a secret alliance with the Edomites. And they in turn made it with the Ammonites. And they in turn with the Syrians, who had started all under him. The Syrians, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, now had a coalition. Philistia didn't join. We don't know why, we're not giving the information. But what was deadly is that the cities of Succoth and Shechem to the north, those cities were designed to protect Israel's northern frontier, they had already secretly agreed to give over to the enemy and let them through. And David didn't know it. So suddenly the attack was launched. Suddenly Israel was reeling. In fact, in verse 3, the point of astonishment is a verse that speaks of reeling as a result of wine called the wine of astonishment here, because they weren't literally drunk. They were reeling. They're under such panic and commotion. The attack from the north was successful, and the people of Shechem joined them. The people of Succoth joined them. The attack had no restraint. By the time David and Israel and Joab can mount a counter, there had already been lives lost. It very much reminds me of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. They came for a wedding and they got slaughtered. The Protestants got slaughtered. In six days, Paris literally ran with blood. The Albertian Massacre in Ireland, the same thing occurred. We hear people condemning Cromwell and realize is that, is that there was an Albertian Massacre. 200,000 Protestants were slaughtered all of a sudden. They and their families, while they slept, The same thing has happened in Africa a number of times. The Armada was designed to do the same thing to England, and a French counterpart to that Armada was designed to attack the colonies, but we were delivered. 
So you have an attack, but it came from all sides. Now you see why they're, we're scattered. It says you cast us off. You've been displeased with us. Yeah, he was displeased. He raised up Samuel, he raised up David, and the people went back. It was backward Christian soldier. They were complacent. They didn't heed the storm clouds that were, that were gathering. It took a monumental work to stop this. David's brilliance as a general and that of Joab is unparalleled. There was everything they could do just from the psalm. You can see that. Verse 2, you've made the earth to tremble. You've broken it. The breaches thereof, it's shaking. They're, they were frightened. They were reeling. Many were dead. That which their complacency had taken for granted, namely peace, was all shattered. You've shown thy people, verse 3, hard things. You've made us a drink of the wine of astonishment. We're reeling from it, quite literally. When a Christian people take the Lord for granted or reject the holiness of his law, they're in for trouble. You can see that David cried before the Lord. Verse 4, you've given us a banner to those that fear thee. There were those who planted their faith. They were the ones that feared God. While others are reeling, there were those that simply planted their faith the fear of the Lord, they did not allow calamity to move them. But they became a pylon in a storm, and they rooted Israel supernaturally. You've given a banner to those that fear thee, so it may be displayed because of the truth. God put men and women in a position to hold the sinews of society when the sinews of society were being torn. He gave a supernatural strength to some who planted themselves as a banner for the sake of the truth. And God was pleased as a result of it. It wasn't just David. It was those who feared the Lord. So that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand and hear me. In verse 6, God has spoken in his holiness, I will rejoice. Nobody says, I will divide Shechem and I will medat. Medat is the Medad is the Hebrew word, medad, meaning I will root out, actually, he's going to first root out, and then he's going to give over the valley of Succoth to Israelites who have been faithful. The people of Succoth were dealt with, and Shechem, they have been so treasonous. They didn't get it right away, but they got it, by way of judgment. And note, the campaign then goes fur further. Gilead is mine. This is a rehearsing of what was taken. Gilead, which is over on the east side of Jordan, was taken. Manasseh's mine. He secured that half of Manasseh on the eastern side of Jordan. Ephraim also is, is the strength of my head. Ephraim launched a counterattack, apparently in the north, and became the strength of David in that sector and stopped and repelled the invaders. Judah is my lawgiver. Judah maintained her strength and continued in uprightness. The result, Moab is my washpot, over Edom I'll cast out my shoe. They're disinherited, they're cursed. Philistia, interestingly enough, triumphed because of me. Somehow the Philistines got word from David, here's your opportunity. And they took out the Edomites to David's east. God made even David's enemies to be at peace with him and divided his enemies against one another again. We've seen that with the Midianites. We've seen that here with the Philistines who triumphed because of David. It says because of me. It's not the Lord, it's David. He opened a gate of opportunity and the Philistines took it and they took territory permanently from the Edomites. Edom would fall, Moab would fall, the Syrians all fell, 
We know historically they sued for peace. It was a brilliant campaign. I wish we had more information on it, but we don't. Verse 12. Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. But you see, the Lord had been the one to not go out with our armies to begin with. You know what he says in verse 10? And thou, o God, did not go out with our armies. He didn't go out with them to begin with. He cast them off. They were scattered because of the attack. They were lethargic. They were complacent. They were schismed in Israel. There was a careless attitude about God's kingdom. They were just living their lives as Jesus warned us not to live. Turn over, please, to Luke, the 12th chapter. In Luke chapter 12. We deal with this theme because Christ keeps bringing it up. In Luke, Luke chapter 12, he says in verse 56, You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth. How is it that you do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge you not what is right? So he's bringing up yet again what he has said in verse 31. Rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. He says, and here's the issue, he calls them hypocrites. We can spend time learning about the weather, being concerned about tomorrow or the next day. We do it all the time. What's the weatherman say about tomorrow? Oh, well, you know, you get your report. We spend the time looking over those reports. But when it comes to this spiritual walk and the warnings, we don't heed the signs of the times. We're lethargic. Turn over for a moment to Genesis 19 to see what I mean. Genesis chapter 19. Now, I do believe that in America there is the beginning of an awakening, even as there was in the 90s for a while. Will it last? There are more people that are finally figuring out that America is in danger. America's Christianity is a target. Will it be too late? We don't know. It's in God's hands. Is God displeased? Will he scatter us? The French Huguenots were much more, were much stronger than what we have in the church today in doctrine and in ethic. And they were scattered. The same is true of the Reformed in Ireland. The Avernian Massacre scattered them. My point here is this. Look in Genesis 19. The two angels have showed up at Lot's, Lot's home. In verse 15, it says, When the morning arose, when the, then the angels hastened, Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him outside the city. Even with the angels there, even with the angels having blinded the inhabitants at the door, even with the announcement of the terrible judgment that's about to come on Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot lingered. The angels had to actually take him and his wife and his daughters and get them out of the house. Note what it says. He lingered, but God was merciful. He provided for the lingering. He actually forced them out the door. The angels pulled them out. He would have lingered. He would have stayed. To make matters worse, in verse 17, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Don't look behind you. Neither stay in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest you be consumed. And Lot says to them, Oh, not so, my Lord. What? They said, don't, don't stay here. 
He said, oh, no, 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 that isn't what you mean. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. And, they, and he said, behold now, he says, behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil take me and I die. Lest some evil take me and I die. What, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't enough? Lest some evil come upon me and I die? He's being warned that a terrible judgment is now impending. It's been described in part, and he's worried about perishing in the mountains. You will notice he recognized the grace that he received, but he doesn't continue to cooperate with it. Thank you for helping me out of the city. Well, I'm glad you did that. Now, can you please take me to a place that's far more comfortable than the mountains? He doesn't cooperate with the grace. He doesn't understand the storm, though all the signs are explained to him. Our Lord Jesus warned his generation yet again. How many times in Luke have we seen this? This is like a theme we've got to go looking back to. It's the same thing that keeps coming up. Our Lord has on his mind a doctrine. He's going to a cross. What we have on our mind is salvation. What he has on his mind is salvation unto a kingdom. For the glory that was set before him, he went to the cross. He secured a bride, he secured a family, he secured a kingdom for them. And he calls us to love deeply enough to work for that kingdom, and the things we are most concerned about will follow. They'll be ours. It isn't that we have to go back to chapter 8 or chapter 4 to get the kingdom and keep rehearsing it in front of you. Christ keeps bringing up chapter after chapter. That's why it sounds redundant. Because he's being redundant. Because they're not hearing his cry for the, and he says it, like the weather. You know, one of the worst things that can happen to you if you're mountaineering, if you're up there in the slopes, you're up there in the ridge, and you find, especially the higher up you get, you find that, that those winds, and they come from underneath sometimes and swirl up. Those winds and the sudden onslaught of storms can catch you. If you don't see the signs ahead of time. It wasn't too long ago that, that people died on Mount Everest. They froze to death up there. They didn't see the storm in time. Actually, they tried to get to the summit and get back down. They knew a storm was coming, but it rose so fast. They were warned. This isn't designed to call them to fall. It just, that's what happened. The storm came so fast, they were at the summit and couldn't get down in time. There was miscalculation. And it was costly. And Christ is saying the same thing. A generation that will not hear the holiness of his law, which bespeaks righteousness, is a generation in peril. Take a look here in the chapter in Luke 12. Please go over there if you would. Lot was caught off guard. You have to understand that Abraham prepared. Lot did not. Lot received mercy, but he who tried to make a better life for himself lost everything. Abraham, who gave himself in faithfulness first for, the God, for God's kingdom, ended up becoming extremely wealthy. But Lot, who chose good land and bad company, invested solely in this life, almost entirely, vexed his righteous soul, and lost everything. If you save your life, you lose it. He almost lost it, but for God's mercy, he would have. He did lose all the wealth that he had accumulated. If you put that first, you're going to lose it. Our Lord, again, if I can put it this way, it's not a complaint, it just is, redundantly says these things of our calling concerning his kingdom. Seek ye first, verse 31. The kingdom of God and all these things we added unto you. Seek that first. 
If we do not in the churches, the storm clouds will begin to come in. Israel was not seeking God's kingdom. David was. Israel was not. David's charge was to establish the worship of the Lord and to reestablish the civil laws of God and hopefully call the people through the Levites to the moral laws of God every Lord, every Sabbath. They didn't want it. They had no such vision. And God was displeased and scattered them. Suddenly their lives were reeling. In verse 3 of chapter 12, We saw, we saw in Psalm 60 that God gives a banner to those that fear him. Look in verse 3 here. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. That which you have spoken in the ear and closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. What you give of yourself for Christ's sake, God will multiply the effect and it will be heard. It will be announced. It might not take root immediately, but God is not unfaithful to forget our labors, as Hebrews tells us, chapter 6. He's not unfaithful for, to forget that we, we've labored in his, in his work. In verse 3, whatsoever you've spoken in darkness, we'll speak in circumstances that are very, very hard, that seem to have no light to them that are discouraging, kind of like Elijah going to the Lord and saying, I'm the only one left. He's speaking in darkness. And God said, what are you doing down here? Get back to Israel, I've reserved 7,000 haven't bowed the knee. When the word of God is preached, very often it's spoken in darkness. John Nevius, the great, China, the great missionary to China, just reading in the memoirs, or reading of his life, actually, uh, his, of his life, his wife, Helen Cohen Nevius wrote of the powerful impact of the gospel in China. With it, they described the power of Satan, the demonic possession, etc. In fact, it's so powerful, so unearthly that when we got back to England, there were many people that simply didn't believe it. The reason for that is that the word of the righteousness had swept England. Now, unrighteousness has swept righteousness out the door in England. But John Nevis's work shook the Chinese landscape. So much so that idolatry was challenged and there was a rebellion. There's a rebellion in China. We call it the Boxer Rebellion. They tried to throw out the foreigners, especially amid the Christians. That was begun to a great extent by John Nevis's preaching. But he preached in darkness. You know where he went to preach? When he got off the boat, he found that a lot of women, it was a regular occurrence for the women to assemble in the temples. He said they were the most faithful idolaters. He would go there and take advantage of their temple meetings and begin to preach. And as he preached, very few responded. In fact, when the men folk got involved, it was usually trying to stop John Nevis. So when you speak in darkness, God guarantees that there will be light that will come out. He will guarantee the work. The announcement will take root and will bear fruit. However, in verse 4, the darkness has fangs. By saying to you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that, if no more they can do, but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after... He hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yet I say unto you, fear him. So you see, there can be a price paid. Don't be afraid of men. He goes on though. Look in verse 21. Excuse me, in verse, let's go back. Um, in verse 13. One of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. During, the, during Christ's preaching, one of the fellows, imagine, you hear the Son of God preaching. And what are you worried about? 
how the will is going to be divided between you and your brother. He says in verse 19, there's a rich man that pulled down his barns and said unto his soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. He had pulled down his barns and built up bigger ones. You hear the Son of God, he's actually here, the desired nations. And they're worried about their barns, their produce, their savings. And God says in verse 20, And him, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Then who shall these things be? They were lethargic. They were complacent. The Son of God, the desire of nations, was there. And they were worried about their barns and their cows. Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. In verse There it's the exact opposite of verse 31. When you seek the kingdom first, he says, you will be provided with what you need. It will be miraculous. God will provide for the needs of those who give their hearts for his kingdom. What of those that do give their lives for the kingdom? Turn over to Genesis. Now, we have this something in the scriptures called the Day of the Lord. Christ warns of storm clouds coming in. You take heed to the storm warnings and prepare yourself to go indoors. What about when I approach a culture? Go back to Genesis. Go to Genesis 3, verse 8. Verse, let's go back to verse 7, in fact. The eyes of them both were open. They knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8, the day of the Lord. First appears here. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Literally, they were up a tree. They were afraid of his voice. He comes to them in the cool of the day. It's the day of the Lord. And they're afraid of his word. And the Lord called Adam and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. Now judgment begins. The day of the Lord has come, and they find themselves naked. They find themselves without, they find themselves reeling. In Israel, Israel didn't prepare, didn't heed Samuel's warning, didn't heed David's warnings. There were other prophets sent to Israel. They remained lethargic and complacent. And suddenly, they were reeling. On all fronts, the north, the east, the south, and even parts of the west, they were reeling from an onslaught they never dreamed could occur. And the Psalm 60 tells us that. To commemorate the day Later on, they'll sing that psalm, and the, the priests, the chief musician, is to raise the signal to raise the trumpets, just like we do in Fourth of July, with all of our fireworks. There's a day where we remember a great deliverance. Psalm 60 records such a deliverance. The people of God showed a lethargy, not unlike Lot, and only God's mercy rescued them. Go to Genesis. 33. In Genesis 33, in Genesis 33, as we read the scripture lesson, we find Jacob. Jacob is a man who, as much as he is, shall we say, um, Upbraided by commentators because his first name was Supplanter and later became Israel. They forget that he is Israel, the prince of God at this point. He lives with Laban 
And Laban's countenance was not toward him as it had been. God had blessed Jacob, but Jacob was a man who sought God's kingdom. How so? He was working for a day in which he'd go back to Palestine. Go back to the land that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and now to him. His poverty put him in a situation for 20 years where he could not do that. He could have gone anywhere else. He would choose to go to Israel or to Palestine and to fulfill the promises there. He would choose a land that would be rife with hardship, and he knew it. But God gave him wealth while under Laban's authority. However, Laban and his sons, we read in the past weeks, so how their countenance fell because you know, they, they, they weren't toward him. Their, their attitude toward him wasn't the same as it had been. So he flees. He flees out of the pot and into the, into the fire. Look in verse 8 of this chapter. Actually, we can go back a bit. In verse 3, And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau's brother into the land of Seir, country of Edom. He had a problem. And that was his brother Esau who hated him. The last time they met, Jacob had to flee. So now he's fleeing from Laban and Laban's sons, and he's got to go through Edom to get there. And he knows his brother had sworn to kill him and was powerful at this point. So he sends a message. He can't just go through the territory. In verse 4, And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak to my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob saith this, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and ass, flocks, and men servants and maidservants. And I've sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in thy sight. What happens next? Esau comes at him with a host of men. All Jacob has is his wives and his little ones, and lots of sheep and cattle. That's it. He tries to move the herds of these and the flocks in front of the men of Peter. These are soldiers, cavalry. They're used to moving through anything. They're men of war. Jacob goes to his knees. There's a statement that says in Scripture, it's what, Psalm or Proverbs 16, when a man's ways please the Lord. Can you finish it? When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Esau comes back and embraces him. The heart's changed toward Jacob. In fact, he wishes him to come back to Mount Seir and to be festive with him, to celebrate. And Jacob gives excuses because the last thing he wants to be is to be trapped in Mount Seir with a brother that just might remember that he lost an inheritance. God delivered Jacob from Laban. And when Laban would have reached out to grab him, the Lord confronted Laban in a dream and said, don't touch the man. Don't say either good or evil to him. What happened was that the Lord surrounded Jacob as a fortress, and Laban was afraid to touch him. The Lord surrounded Jacob, and Esau came to celebrate with him. Jacob would go into Palestine, and when his sons would sin, and Jacob was afraid that the entirety of the Canaanites would, be launched, would launch their attacks against him because of what his sons did, they were stilled. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. That comes with a man's desire to build Christ's kingdom. We're going to need that kind of strength of character in years ahead in America. I believe the storm clouds are growing, and there are many pastors that feel the same way. There are more and more Christians that are fearful. So with the storm clouds gathering, ought we not to be at work in preparation? 
so that when they do come, when the storm does come, there are people that fear the Lord and can put up the banner that will settle the land, maybe even cause it to repent. How do we do that? I'd like you to turn for a moment. Go to Exodus 19. Turn to Exodus chapter 19. We celebrate the communion this morning. The communion, in fact, each of the Lord's days are a day of the Lord. The communion in particular is a day of the Lord, where the Lord draws near to his people to try them. In a similar manner, the people of God were prepared for the giving of the Decalogue, which we read this morning. Chapter 19, note these preparations that God puts his people through. In verse 6, it's enough to say we need to prepare. How then do we do so? Verse 6, you shall, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. First of all, we're supernatural pe people. God attends us with supernatural influence. When we speak in darkness, we'll come to light. We'll carry the law of the Lord like the Ark of the Covenant borne by the Levites. We are a royal priesthood. Our intercessions and our prayers are effective. Jacob prayed and he was delivered from Laban and from Esau. Look in verse 8. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Moses is an intercessor. The people don't realize what it's going to take to follow the Lord. They mean well, but they're not prepared to follow Christ. And so the Lord, when Moses returns, he gets instructions. Because what's going to happen very soon is that God is going to come down on Mount Sinai and deliver the law of the Lord. And the people are not going to be prepared for it. In verse 10, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. They wash their clothes as symbolic of that purification of the heart that's necessary. They prepared themselves to meet the Lord. Let me ask you, what preparation did you make in preparation to meet the Lord this morning? What preparation did you make? How did you, as it were, wash your clothes? There is, in part, in Christendom, the assumption that when we go there, the Lord will just react. Will he? Is that all we have to do is show up and he jumps to? Our presence commands his attention? They were to be prepared to receive the law of God and none of them were. And by the way, the third day is the first day of the week, the day after the seventh day. It's the Sabbath. The proof of that is beyond today. They were to wash themselves, wash their clothes, and prepare for something very special. And they knew that it meant symbolically, the hygiene meant a cleansing. It meant dealing with their thoughts, their sinfulness, their way of life. What was hidden should be put aside. Clean yourself, get ready. Verse 12 Thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, To keep yourselves, that ye you go not up into the mount, nor touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall surely be put to death. Just like the tree in the garden, they were given boundaries here. The boundary here was right around the mountain. Do not approach the law of God on your own. Don't assume to pick it up and use it as you wish. We're in a generation that is in, are in the throes of change. We know that something's wrong in the churches. And every fad there is, is being undertaken, especially in matters of worship, um, matters of doctrine. There's all sorts of innovations, except basic things. The single greatest body of commands, and you've heard me say it many times, 
are the commandments and the prohibitions concerning God's law. You can read about them in Psalm 119. The very body that is put aside in the church. So we look for spontaneity in the spirit. We look for fruits undisclosed, undefined in the spirit. <coughs> and we redefine the law of God as a museum piece, a bygone era. However, that will change. It always does. When the Lord approaches the culture and the people are awakened to their distress, you will see the whole world in the church go to the law of God. J. Gresham Machen in 1924, I believe it was, wrote a tract about, about America's departure from the law of God. He saw it back then. He said, the day will come where the law will return to America. And it will be a day of, can anybody guess what he said next? Not morning. That's close. Close. It would be a day of terror. When the law of God returns to America and American Christianity takes hold of it, it will be a day of terror. One of the greatest messengers in the history of the Church of Christ, J. Gresham Machen, wrote back there in the 1920, by 1923 or 24, that we've lost God's law. We've lost our moorings in the church. The church is everywhere. She will be judged. God will bring back the law of the Lord, its holiness. He'll bring it back as the basis for our doctrines. And it will be a day of terror. Why? The same reason that when a storm comes upon you and you're unprepared, what happens? God will bring a storm to bring about the law of the Lord. And when you're unprepared for the storm, don't get caught up in a mountain slope with high winds and rain or snow. You better see the signs of the times, and we have them all over America, written large. It's a time of mourning, folks. A time for our hearts to cry unto God. A time for individual fasting. Look at what it says in verse 15. Excuse me, verse 14. Moses went down from the mountain of the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. He used an outward picture of an inward adornment. He had them do something to clean so that they would be, learn to prepare by way of illustration what clean inside was to be. In verse 15, and he said unto the people, be ready against the third day, come not unto your wives. Even sexual regularity was a stopped. Everything stops. For what God was about to do. That's how serious it was. Something that's commanded of God inside marriage was stopped temporarily. As they prepared their hearts, a wholeheartedness toward the Lord. That's the call of the king. In verse 15, verse 16, excuse me, verse 15, be ready against the third day. Again, I call you. How did you prepare to meet the Lord this morning? What was in your heart by way of preparation? Your worship should not start when you walk in the door. How were you prepared to meet the Lord this morning. Not how you were prepared to come to church or to Sunday school. What was it that grabbed your heart and put you on your knees before God and took you wholeheartedly before his throne in preparation? You expect a result without a preparation. There's a kingdom that he died for. You're it. How do we prepare to meet the, to stop life and meet the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the universe? You know, the devils come into his presence and they tremble. They are afraid to come there. The angels prostrate themselves. They cover themselves with wings. They won't look upon his, his holiness. What about his sons and daughters? How do they honor their father? Or is it just about dads and 
Praise God, we have good fathers here. But it shouldn't stop there. America needs to worship. I'll give you the innovation of worship that I believe the fad that we ought to reestablish here in America. We don't need different changes in worship so much. Here's one that we do need. De Tocqueville said it. We've abandoned it. Americans are productive through the week. The hustle and the bustle in this city, you can't tell where business stops. Everybody is a buzz, but then Saturday comes. And things slow down. As the evening settles, so does the city. In our terms, you can hear a pin drop. Sunday, here and there, there's a, a person flitting across the street. Shades are drawn. However, around the churches, there are carriages, there are horses, there are streams of people coming in. There, there's worship. You see, Saturday night, they were combing their heart. A whole city were combing and settling their hearts to meet the Lord. I'm not saying you have to 